They walk that dusty road for hours. It's seven miles to Emmaus. They remark on the turbulent political times. They don't know which side the stranger might be on, so they just say vaguely, did you hear about that trouble in Jerusalem? What small talk do you make with a stranger on a long walk? Or back in the days when we got stuck next to strangers on airplanes or train trips? Look at that swallow dive. Did you see the color on that lily? What's up with that strange tree? Even their small talk reminds them of Jesus. They get to the house. Their stomachs are growling. Come in, they tell them. The day is almost done. They gather at the food. She brings the bread right from the fire. The smell of coal and hot flame clings to this bread. They all watch that steaming bread rush this blessing, their empty stomachs beg. And they watch him lift the bread, not their host, not the head of the house. The stranger takes the bread. He says the blessing, bread above his head. With the familiar words, he breaks it and shares one piece to the left, one piece to the right. And sometime between their stomach growl and the first taste on their tongues, they know this is Jesus, their friend, their teacher, their healer, their leader, their lost one. Why would Jesus, who loves them, who knows they are grieving and afraid, walk with them to Emmaus in secret and then vanish as soon as they realize who he is? I have no idea. This is not the first time we witness Jesus' provocative nature in a mysterious story. We read of Jesus' tenderness in stories like the healing of the man born blind. We read of Jesus' fierceness in stories like the overturning of tables at the temple. We read of Jesus' provocative nature in stories like his interruption of the killing of the woman caught in adultery or his mysterious statement about paying taxes. I don't understand why Jesus' friends don't recognize him or why he disappears as soon as they do. But because the story unfolds this way, we are directed to what Jesus does with bread. They know who Jesus is because they know what Jesus does with bread. And even though We've never watched Jesus handle bread. We have some idea how to recognize him too. Jesus takes, Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and shares in the feeding of the multitudes at the Last Supper and in this story. This is what to do with bread. Take, bless, break, share. Feeding the multitudes. Thousands of people gather to hear him preach all day they're together and they're getting hungry and they're not in a town where they could find food. They're out on the hillside with Jesus and the disciples and Jesus decides they will feed each other right there. So the disciples gather the people's food and it's not much, but they hand the few loaves of bread to Jesus. He takes, he blesses, he breaks, he shares. And there is more than enough for those thousands of people. The story is recorded six times throughout the Gospels. We don't know how many times the event happened, but six times we read what Jesus does with bread. And then at the Last Supper, Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and shares bread. When Jesus gives us the practice of communion, it is by taking, blessing, breaking, sharing sharing bread. And today we read that his own friends don't recognize him until he takes, blesses, breaks, and shares bread with them. I wonder if any of them could even describe just how it is that Jesus takes or blesses or breaks or shares bread that is so familiar. 
Maybe they could, but maybe their recognition is that rather unconscious way of knowing, like muscle memory, because we know things that we cannot explain. I could always tell who was coming up the stairs in my childhood home. If I really tried, I could probably figure out how. I think my mom's footsteps are the most deliberate. My sisters are the quickest, or maybe that's my dad. I can't describe them to you. But if I was upstairs in that house this morning, I would absolutely know who was coming up the stairs from the sound. I grew up in laid back Midwestern culture where everyone waits at four way stop signs, waving to each other. This is what we do in line in the rural Midwest. We wait, we wave. After I'd been living in Minneapolis for a few years, I was on my way to a church meeting with Nan Erba, a brother and pastor who lives in rural Ohio. We were at the gate waiting for our flight. And when our zone number was called, I joined the clump of people trying to figure out where the line was and how to get to the front of it. We were all subtly butting in front of each other when the opportunity arose. But then I noticed Nan. Not only was she waiting patiently for the line to sort itself out, she was kindly waving other people in front of her. I joined an irrational mob. None of us would leave any sooner by getting to the front of that line, along with my embarrassment about my unconscious mob behavior. I felt homesick for myself, the self I'd been only a few years before when my muscle memory would have me hanging back, waving people by and smiling with Nan. My muscles made new memories in the big city years. This is what to do in line. This is what to do with bread. Who will recognize you? What muscle memory expresses your identity to this world? We sing, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And that's a good start. Alexander Mack, who helped start the Church of the Brethren, said people would know us by the manner of our living. Jesus' friends know him by what he does with bread. By what in your loving, by what in your living do people recognize you? This is what to do with bread. Take Bless, break, share. I'd like to focus a whole sermon on just those four words because it's not as simple as four words might imply. The gospel stories were oral tradition among communities that spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Eventually they were written down in Greek, like the scripture from Luke that we're reading today, and some were probably written in Hebrew, like the gospel of Matthew, and then these were translated into Latin and then all the languages that people actually spoke, and those languages kept changing. So four words are never as simple as four words. So for today, we can let these four actions be as plain as possible. This is what Jesus does with bread. Take. He takes the bread. He gathers attention. Focus on this bread, this meal, this moment, this table. Here we are to receive and to be fed. Bless. The traditional table prayer does not bless the bread, but thanks God for the blessing of bread. Because all of the earth is God's creation and all that bursts and blooms forth from the earth, the grains, the fruits, the creatures are God's. This bread is God's. So the blessing is to thank God. Break, whether it's baked in a clay oven or on hot stones, lining an open fire, the bread is baked for the table. Maybe you could eat a whole piece yourself, but you don't. The first piece is broken and passed around. And if you're still hungry, you'll break off a piece of the next bread that comes your way. Share. Now Jesus has bread in each hand. Is he going to pass one and eat the other? Remember how the disciples argue sometimes about which of them is the greatest? And who gets to sit in that place of honor at the table? A table tradition in their culture was that the head of the household would give thanks for the bread, break off a piece for himself, it was definitely a him, 
and then pass the bread to the person on his right, the guest of honor, who would break off a piece and pass the rest of the bread to the right. Around the table, the bread would go from the most honored to the least honored. And Jesus disrupts that over and over. He tells the disciples to quit arguing about who is the greatest because the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jesus kneels and washes their feet at the table. He acts both as the head of the household, taking blessing, sharing the bread, and he acts as the slave of the household, kneeling to wash their feet. Jesus has two pieces of bread in his hand now. And we read that he gave the bread to them, them. In each of the six stories of the feeding of the multitudes at the Last Supper, and here in Emmaus, scripture says each time that Jesus gives the bread to them. And I believe he is sharing both pieces at once. One from his right hand and one from his left. Sharing bread this way means there is no hierarchy of greatness. Sharing bread this way is in the manner of Jesus living, giving everything away like he asks us to, giving away even himself. And now the pattern can start again, because how did Jesus take the bread in the first place? Someone gave it to him, the woman of the house, a servant, someone baked that bread that Jesus gets to feed us with. We should be recognized by the manner of our living. We recognize Jesus because this is what he does with bread, take, bless, break, share. This is what we do with our burdens. Take, bless, break, share. That's why we voice our joys and concerns every Sunday to offer each other the opportunity to love us, to hold us in prayer, to take a piece of our burden so we can all share the load together. We are known by the manner of our praying together. We are known by the manner of our eating together, especially when we have potlucks. Take your dish, bless the gathering, break bread and casseroles and brownies into servings and share the nourishment. A potluck is a faithful brethren act. Sure, we could bring our own sandwich and eat what we like, but when we have a potluck, we're putting our faith in one another that we'll have enough. And moreover, that we'll have a well-rounded meal only because each other has come to the table. Of course, Christians, not even brethren, have a corner on this manner of our living, or they'll know us by our love. Before many of us had stocked our pantries, mutual aid groups sprung up online throughout the country by all kinds of people, church people, mosque people, synagogue people, sleep in on Sunday people, people who care about their neighbors' pantries first. This is what to do with fear and its partner greed. Give generously and say thank you. This is what to do with sorrow, with all we wish this spring had been instead. We reach across religious, cultural, and economic lines and take. Take focus and attention to the sorrow and the situation at hand. Bless. Give thanks for what is good and find where God is at work break break down the mess the sorrow the cruelty the fear break it down into bite-sized pieces and share pass it around again and again 
May we be recognized by the manner of our living. Amen.